Today on Dora Hope, the answer to stress. And I can live higher because of the risen sun. My life is fuller because of what God's done. I am complete in Christ. He makes me whole. My protector and Welcome to Door of Hope. There are so many powerful, wonderful scriptures in the New Testament that really basically deal with all of our feelings. Uh, yes, sin is part of it, but after we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, accepted his forgiveness for our sins, we want to go on, as Paul said, pressing forward. So the answer to the stress and the pressing forward is these precious words, these words of revelation uh, for all of us. And they, they're beautifully, they're beautiful. They, they cover the subject, they address the problem, but they don't preach the problem, they move to the answer. You know, it bugs me when we spend too much time on our problems as Christians and then we disregard the answer or maybe just throw in uh, one line when all of the scriptures, basically the focus, the focus to the stresses of life are the Holy Scriptures. It says, uh, even Jesus' words, uh, you know, he's the woman taken in adultery, um, you've had five husbands, one you're living with isn't your husband, go sin no more. His uh, focus for our lives is not the stress, but the answer. And the New Testament holds the answer to those feelings we have in our heart, those disappointments of life, uh, those regrets, those sorrows. It is all there, uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory. If we look at uh, 2 Corinthians, and this is why, uh, chapter 12, he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I'm weak, then I'm strong. So if you have someone in your life that uh, beats you up, maybe the answer to him, you're right, uh, but when I'm weak, I'm strong. And hallelujah, that we can accept our limitations and not pressure ourselves for more, more, more. Uh, the answer for the Christian, for the believer, for even the unbeliever is more of you, more of you, of things I've had my fill, but I hunger still for more of you, because we have to lay aside those problems and those concerns uh, that so easily uh, discourages us, stresses us. And just lift our hands and say, Lord, more of you, of things I've had my fill, but I hunger still for more of you. So whatever situation we are in, whatever need is there, uh, as we lift our hearts and believe in him, and call from our hearts, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, more of you, more of you. For in you I am strong. In you I can do it. It is God who gives us strength. It's not a matter of power over positive thinking. It's that Christ, by his mercy and grace, dwells within us and enables us and pushes us. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not our own strength, our own mind over matter. It's truly, truly the Spirit of God. Paul's in prison uh, and he's praising God and the door is open and uh, he's able to leave. And uh, it's not that we ever get it together, but we know the one who ha is the sum total of all things. Carrying on in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he said, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. 
test yourselves, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? There it's so beautifully said. Uh, if you're discouraged, if you're downcast, if, if you have uh, insurmountable obstacles, uh, the answer is, you know, lift your hands and say, Lord, my answer is that I, in you I live and move and have my being. In you, in Jesus Christ we live because it says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It's already been spoken our way out. He is the only answer to stress. And uh, as Paul said, nevertheless, it is not I who lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we need it. We need it of things we've had our fill, but we hunger still for more of you. Continuing in Corinthians and that grace of God which is sufficient for us, it goes on to say that, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So what a chance that we can really go sin no more, realize that in Christ we are a new create, creation. We can't do anything about death, as I mentioned last week in the church bulletin, but we can choose how then shall we live. There's a book written about it. Uh, we can choose how we live. In him we live and move and have our being. Praises unto God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I do recommend uh, becoming very acquainted with the New Testament especially. Uh, read, even if it isn't a chapter a day, a few lines and, you know, get your head straight and focus on that and the great and precious promises. So it says, we're confident. He said, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and behold, everything has become new. And this is a confidence that we have through Christ towards God, not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Isn't that a wonderful promise? That even though we have things in the natural realm that the Spirit overcomes them, overcomes that, and that confidence by His grace and mercy is the answer for our lives. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things in Him. I remember uh, hearing a message, study what it means to be in Him. It says that in Him we move and have our being. In Him we are made whole. In Him we have forgiveness of sins. In Him we have new life. In Him we have eternal life. And what a joy that if we possess that and, and realize uh, and entertain the knowledge of that, that we can by His grace keep pressing forward, keep moving forward, keep um, live a life of joy and a life of, of faithfulness, a life where we are whole, a life where all things, and in fact it says here in 1 Corinthians 16, keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Let anyone be accursed who has no love for the Lord. Our Lord comes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. How often we miss meditating and thinking about the great love God has for us, that sometimes we're lonely, we're alone, we feel no one has understood us or appreciated us or even loved us. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will never, never perish, 
but have everlasting life. So it is the love of God in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit that changes our world, that deals with all that needs to be dealt with. He will lead us. He will direct us. He will, by divine providence, even arrange our path and our circumstances. Uh, believe it, I remember uh, starting Door Hope, being asked to do it, and not being sure if I could, and just simply praying, Lord, for your will to be done, that I might know your will. And uh, he manifested that by giving a special gift by Dr. Paul Smith that enabled me to begin. And now, uh, 34 years later plus, I am still keeping on. God is there for us in that manner, sometimes in the still small things, but in, sometimes in the much larger. And uh, one lady said um, to me not so long ago on the prayer line, Rhonda, you're lucky. And I, I said, luck has nothing to do with it, dear. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're confident of this very thing, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will never, never perish, but have everlasting life. There are other verses about our faith. Yeah, I like this one. It says, Do you not know that in a race that the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do not do it to receive a perishable crown. But we are we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. But I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I should not be disqualified. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that rock was Christ. He is our rock, our source, our love, uh, the gift of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost poured out for the church enabling us to hear his voice, to be empowered, to receive the impossible. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I, I don't know uh, in my journey of faith if I would have been lucky. I don't think so. But I do know in my journey of faith that I have been blessed by God, that he does above all that we would ever think possible. And we can keep pressing forward Moving forward, uh, you know, I love the Apostle Paul and his words of life, and he talks about that in Philippians, pressing towards the mark of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And he says, why? Why do I do it? Because he said, I do it because Christ has laid hold of me. And for the Christian, we know the feeling. We know the experience of the love of God and the power of his Holy Spirit and the wholeness that comes from knowing him, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, even in the fellowship of his suffering. But it says that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So I want to keep keeping on. I want to, we give him our hearts. We love him because he first loved us. And we call upon him in our times of need for through prayer, uh, with others, sometimes on one-on-one, -on -one, that we might receive that which we have need of. So, Lord, we do pray together by your grace and mercy for the love of God to rule in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we might know you in a deeper way, that we might run the race and be successful, that we might be transformed by the power and glory of God. And we together say thank you, Lord. Thank you, amen, and amen, and amen. So be it, so be it, so be it. Sorrows, what a 
name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah! What a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon. With his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished. Was his cry now in heaven exalted high? Hallelujah! What a Savior! When he comes, our glorious King. All is ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah. Hello, it's nice to be with you once again on Door of Hope as we explore issues of faith and our journey with Christ. Today's focus is on stress, and the answer to stress that we have heard is found in Holy Scripture. I think that's true because when you look at Holy Scripture, it's not just a collection of what you're supposed to do sayings, but it is a story of people's lives. It is the witness of God in terms of what God is doing for humanity. It's the story of Jesus, the story of the disciples, of the patriarchs and the matriarchs that go back to the days of Israel. But it's also wisdom literature that guides us in life. It is poetry, psalms, which sing out to praise God and where also anguishes are expressed. We have a whole book of lamentations, which the author pours out his soul in terms of it being tortured and really that state of stress. And so for the answer to be stress, to, for stress to be found in scripture, I do think makes sense because the witness of Scripture is about the witness of human life, of how God engages with humanity at a collective and an individual level. And indeed, in Scripture, we see that stress is real. Now, one of the foundational theologies or understandings of the Christian faith is called incarnational theology. It's how we look at Jesus. It is that understanding that Jesus is God, but he became human 
and lived among us. This is part of the classic doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where we see God in three persons, but it is one being. And it is a complex theological argument. It's fascinating. It's at the heart of the creeds. If you read through the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, it talks about God who is creator and who has made everything. It talks about God who is the Son, Jesus, who lived amongst us, and God who is the Holy Spirit, who is with us always and who sustains us in our lives. It's that second part of the Trinity, Jesus, that I would like to turn to because often there are misunderstandings in and around Jesus. Some people look at Jesus simply as a wisdom teacher. And Jesus was a wisdom teacher, but there have been many wisdom teachers throughout the ages. Jesus was more than a wisdom teacher. Some people look at Jesus and they become very familiar with him. And I think of that great old hymn, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And there is something about Jesus where he does walk with us and talk with us and where we are his own, but there's more to it. In the book of Hebrews, it has probably one of the best explanations for really what the nature of Jesus is all about. And if you'd like a little bit of homework, I would suggest reading Hebrews. It will be the theme of some programs coming up in the very near future. And it is a wonderful book which speaks of the place of Jesus in our lives. The classic theologian that I like in terms of understanding the nature of Jesus is Richard Hooker. And he really talks about Jesus being fully human and fully divine. I like that because it allows the mystery of the Jesus to remain. It does not mean we need to explain every aspect of his being, but it also recognizes the truth of what Jesus is all about. Jesus is divine. Jesus was there at creation. Jesus is eternal. But Jesus is also human. He also has lived as one of us. He has walked that human journey. And it's important we think along these lines because I think within this understanding of Jesus, we have a true sense of how Jesus is the answer to the questions of life. Today, the question is about stress. When we look at that incarnational theology, we see indeed the divinity of God and the wonder and the mystery, but we also see very well the human nature of Jesus and what he faced. And there are many examples of this within scripture. When Jesus' friend Lazarus dies, he cries. Shortest verse in scripture, Jesus wept. But we also see it during the Passion that time when Jesus was arrested, tried, crucified, and died. Before he is arrested, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you travel throughout the Holy Land, it is one of the most serene, beautiful places. They say the olive trees that are there, Jesus would have prayed under. It is truly majestic and beautiful. It is a place of prayer. It is right outside the Mount of Olives. And you can see why Jesus went to that particular spot. And Jesus prayed, and the scriptures give witness to what Jesus went through that night before his arrest. He sweated blood. He asked if this cup could pass from his lips, and he asked if there was another way, a way where he would not have to face the cross, which, as we know, was an absolute brutal and painful death. And I say all this, not even so much to focus on how difficult the passion is, but rather to recognize that when we look at Jesus who is human, that theology of incarnation, that we have a true sense that God knows what it is like to live the lives that we lead. 
God lived and died as one of us in the form of Jesus. Now, this should be revolutionary to us. It should really shock our thinking to know that the maker of all lived as us and feared death, feared pain, came to the cross, not with a sense that it was accomplished all in advance, but with a realization of necessity, with a desire in his heart that it not happen, and with a fear and stress which expressed itself in the sweating of blood. And if Jesus could go through that, I think that indeed he is the answer, well, the answer to all questions, but ultimately the answer to stress, a state many of us live much of our lives in. The truth is there are many things we cannot do anything about the state of the world, uh, some of the going-ons in our communities or our families, the aging process itself, whatever those circumstances that we find ourselves living in. But what can change is how we respond to them. Do we let them consume us? Do they become the core of our identity? Do we find ourselves just dwelling upon those things of stress? Or are we dwelling with Christ? Are we leaning upon him? Are we realizing that he is walking to with us and talking with us because he has lived as one of us and he is the answer? Stress can be debilitating. Faith, though, brings life. We are called to be a people of faith. Faith, hope, and love, as the scriptures say, they are all eternal. They all abide with us, and they are a gift. Thank you, Darcy. The answer, the love of God to walk in the power of his love. God bless you. Have a great week. The beauty of Jesus is always around me. I see his wonderful work. In the surrounding beauty. We trust this program has been a door of hope for you, and we encourage you to call the prayer line. Door of Hope is entirely viewer supported. It is your financial gifts that allow us to remain on the air. All gifts payable to Rhonda Lazert Ministries are tax deductible. For more information on Rhonda Lazert Ministries, or to order one of Rhonda's books or steel CDs, please call 905-901-2048 or visit us on the web at doorofhope.ca. Our mailing address is Rhonda Lazert Ministries, Post Office Box 67, Lakeshore West, Oakville, Ontario, L6K0A3.